Hello, everyone. Welcome, viewers, to this series, Exploring Careers in the Green Economy. This episode is titled Accelerating Renewable Solutions in Cities. My name is Xander Kessler, and I'm a member of the class of 2022.5 at Middlebury College. And I would like to introduce this episode's guest speaker. I'm joined today by Ali Rotatori from the class of 2014, who is a manager for the Urban Transformation Initiative with the Rocky Mountain Institute. Welcome, and thank you for joining us, Ali. Thanks for having me. Super excited. Of course. So, Ali, this series explores a number of different professional areas involved with the broader concept of the green economy. Could you tell us a little bit about the Rocky Mountain Institute, or RMI, and how that fits in with the green economy? Yeah, happy to. So, RMI has been around since 1982, um, and we are focused on tackling the climate crisis by working on its main contributor, which is energy production and use. Um, energy production use account for about 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So we do this through rapid market-based change in the world's most critical geographies. Um, and we work with uh, businesses, policymakers, communities, and other organizations to identify and scale energy system interventions that will cut greenhouse gas emissions to by at least 50% by 2030. That's kind of our anchoring goal uh, for the next 10 years. Um, and so uh, for you know over 40 years or nearly 40 years now, um, RMI has utilized techno-economic expertise and a whole systems thinking approach to both publish groundbreaking research and analysis and um, working with a variety of, of actors in this space. Uh, we bring together collaborations of uh, rare reach range and expertise um, creating unconventional partnerships and mobilizing action to drive change on a massive scale that's needed to combat the climate crisis. Awesome. So you talk about, you know, those, those unusual partnerships and, you know, you interact with obviously all sorts of different organizations. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about, you know, uh, who, who your clients are, who you're working for, um, and, you know, sort of the other organizations that your organization creates those partnerships between? Yeah. So RMI focuses on kind of a bunch of different areas of the energy sector. So for example, we have programs focused on carbon-free electricity, carbon-free buildings, carbon-free mobility. And so the partners will look different kind of depending on, on who you're working with specifically. So we work with, um, you know, electric utilities in the U.S. We'll work with um, supporting kind of techno-economic analysis to make better transportation policies at, you know, city, state, and national levels. Um, we will support kind of the creation of building standards and things like that that'll support greener buildings going forward. Um, we also have programs in breakthrough technology, which is focused on scaling climate tech, uh, climate intelligence, which uh, their goal is to kind of make, make emissions visible and make this um, an easier thing to talk about, um, that are working on more of the tech side. And so they work a lot with um, different tech partners in the space, more in the private sector. Um, and then um, the team that I'm on, the Urban Transformation team is specifically focused on making this change at a uh, municipal level. And so we partner with a lot of um, city governments, obviously, and then other think tanks or community-based organizations um, that kind of know under are on the ground locally and understand what the community is and um, how, to, how to make the best intervention at that, at that level. Um, and then ARMA is, is an international organization. So we have we have five offices in the US and then an office in India and an office in China. Um, and so I'm, I also uh, spend 50% of my time on our urban transformation program in India. Um, and so there we're working a lot with the national government um, through a uh, climate center for cities program that they launched earlier this year um, and work a lot more um, at the in the government levels there. So kind of a wide variety um, of partners, but you know, when you, once you're on a specific team, um, the kind of segment of the market you're targeting becomes a little clearer. Awesome, yes, yeah, so that's a good uh, transition because I was next gonna ask you about, you know, your specific role with the uh, Urban Transformation Initiative. So could you sort of give us a general overview of what exactly it is you do? Yeah, so I'll give a quick overview of um, Urban Transformation first and talk a little bit more about what I do specifically. Perfect. But um, the UT program was established to help cities simultaneously reduce emissions, enhance urban livability, increase resilience, uh, and advance equity. 
and we provide deeply practical technical assistance directly to cities as long, along with capacity building to help them kind of move these projects forward um, going in the future. Um, and for the past two years, I've specifically worked on this initiative called the City Renewables Accelerator, which was part of the American Cities Climate Challenge, where we supported um, a variety of cities directly in their renewable energy procurement space. So now we are expanding outside of just helping cities with their renewable procurement to also help uh, cities with building decarbonization, zero carbon mobility, smarter planning and land use strategies, nature-based solutions, and industry engagement. Um, and so that's kind of the goal for the program over the next few years is to expand to be able to create a more of a one-stop shop for cities and help them think about this problem holistically instead of kind of piecemeal in, in different segments. So what exactly is, is your role within that, uh, you know, broader group? Yeah, so um, I have supported cities one-on-one. -on -one. We work um, with 17 cities in almost like a consulting relationship um, through this American Cities Climate Challenge. And so I've supported um, some of those cities with their renewable energy purchases, which kind of involves a range of things, whether it's creating a techno-economic model to help them project the financing um, and economic implications of uh, renewable purchase or um, helping them create a pitch deck to actually break to their city council or their mayor to explain you know, why they need to do this, what, um, what are the other options, who else has done this, et cetera. And then also I've worked with some cities who have successfully invested in renewable energy projects to spread those learnings to their broader communities, so running workshops with them um, to take their lessons learned and kind of explain what else other, other cities in, in their area or other community organizations, um, you know, school districts, et cetera, can, how they can kind of take advantage of the same opportunities that the city had uh, successfully completed. Um, so that's kind of one major part of my work. Um, I, we also work with some cities in higher level groups called cohorts that we um, help achieve a common goal on a similar timeline. So for example, in 2019, I uh, co-led a group of about 15 cities that were interested in purchasing offsite renewable energy. Um, so this is like large scale, you know, potentially the wind farm you see behind me, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily rooftop solar in your community, but really for cities who have, you know, 100% clean energy goals, um, they're gonna need to do something at scale at some point. So we worked with 15 cities through um, over nine months through kind of a step-by-step -step process um, where every month they would come back and say, you know, we're, we've completed this step in the process and we would support them by providing them with tools and resources, answering questions, kind of giving our advice on how to run the process, who to involve, um, and then also kind of creating that peer learning atmosphere where, you know, some, some people may move a little bit faster or a little bit slower, um, but you're all, all along the same general timeline. So being able to kind of look at the people who are a step ahead of you and ask them for help and then be able to turn to the people who are a step behind you and um, support them as well is um, something that the cities have found uh, really helpful. They definitely like hearing from each other sometimes more than they like hearing from us. So <laughs> that's a, it's a good, a good aspect there. Awesome. Um, what's the most challenging part of your job? That's a great question. I think one of the most challenging parts of working in this space is that uh, climate change is like a really big, obviously complex problem. And we, we need to kind of break it down in different ways and explain it to people um, in a way that one, makes sense to them, but two, makes it important for them. And that, that changes in every location and with every person that you're talking to. So, you know, there are some communities where job creation is much more important than carbon reduction. And so you're talking about it from a job creation standpoint and you really need to like be in that community to understand what their priorities and, and goals are. Um, and so I think one of the complicated things is that like, is just getting that on the ground knowledge is hard when you're a national, international institution. Um, and so that's something we've done. We've kind of learned a lot through this process and trying to partner a lot more with community organizations and people who really know, um, know the community to, to get that work. Um, and I think also just like taking all of that complex, scary jargon that people hear about climate change and then turning it not only to something people can understand, but like a compelling narrative. 
around why why they should care um and you know what's going to happen if we don't act and what is your personal contribution and what is your city's contribution and how is that related to you know what corporations are doing and so just like really kind of you know i could spend like a full 24-hour day trying to explain my job to someone who doesn't who doesn't know exactly what it is and i um, wasn't in this space and like it, it it's hard it, you really learn quickly that you need to be able to take that like 24 hours of knowledge that you have and condense it into like a two minute conversation into like what is the top line um aspect for for you and why should you care so i would say that's that's probably one of the biggest challenges um that we have i think also working with cities has um been super interesting because um cities you know I used to work with corporations on on climate change and a lot of corporations when they're investing in these large scale renewable projects they you know they have a mandate from their ceo or they know they're doing it for you know it's a good reason but it's it's ultimately to say that they are combating climate change like that's the one goal but like i said cities aren't just doing it to combat climate change right they're doing it because they're a coastal community and sea level rise is going to decimate you know like a percentage of their land in the next 10 20 30 years um or they're doing it because they are a, a community that's been supported by the coal or the gas industry and they realize that they need to start thinking about how the transition is going to impact their um constituents and how they need to kind of uh prepare for that um or they're doing it because they are a, a community that is really focused on climate change and their, you know, taxpayers and constituents are want to tackle from a carbon side. And so um, I think cities are just, they're so complex and there's so many different priorities, which I think is, is great. Um, but it, it makes it um, more, you kind of have to come at it from a bunch of different angles versus just like climate change and carbon. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so I was wondering if you could, you mentioned earlier that you, do a lot of work also in India. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and how it compares to your work in the US. Yeah, so we are just launching our urban transformation program in India. Um, RMI has in India, uh, a sister organization called RMI India. Uh, we have about, I think 30 people in an office in, in Delhi in, in normal, you know, non-COVID times, obviously. Um, and so our, our India team is really focused on working in specific cities and states on mobility and um, grid uh, grid electrification work. Um, and so we are now kind of trying to figure out exactly how we launch this urban transformation, so city-focused program um, in, in that context. So the work we're doing now is, is still really strategy and, and level setting, but what it looks like we'll do first um, is support this Climate Center for Cities um, mission that I had mentioned earlier that's run by the National Institute of Urban Affairs um, with um, support on rooftop solar for municipal government buildings, um, helping kind of governments understand that process and understand how to access financing and what the kind of economics and techno economic implications will be, um, as well as um, helping them increase their clean shared mobility or create clean shared mobility plans. Um, so we're we're just embarking on that work, um, but we'll be working on it over the next like three to six months. Awesome. Um, all right. Next, could you talk about what what your favorite part of your job is, or the accomplishment that you're most proud of, or what you find the most interesting? What What do you like about it? Yeah. Um, I think the capacity building work that we're doing in cities is probably the what I'm most proud of our program for doing. I think it's really. Um, I think working at a uh, think tank when I kind of started uh, kind of looking for jobs and came to this space, I had envisioned it would be a lot more kind of research based. And that was something I wasn't necessarily looking forward to. I really do like being on the ground. And so I was pleasantly surprised that RMI was also pretty implementation focused. And so I think the, um, the ability to work with cities and, you know, have someone realize that you're there to help teach them for them to kind of take this work forward and help teach everyone else in the organization or in the city um, or the people that come after them, you know, when our support may not necessarily always be there. Um, I think that part is, is really rewarding. So, you know, creating a financial model um, and passing it off to a city staffer who then kind of owns it and tweaks it and comes back to you like six months later and is like, hey, I'm, I'm passing this off to someone else. Like, 
can you help me answer this one question? And you realize that like this thing that you created, you know, is now going to live on in multiple uh, levels um, after. So I think, I think that that's been um, really inspiring to me uh, because I, I get to kind of dip a toe in, in working at a city government and then take a step back. And these people, those people have incredibly difficult jobs, um, especially now um, over the past year with, you know, fin huge financial implications and budget implications because of COVID. Um, those, all of their jobs and priorities, a lot of them have shifted. So um, it's really, really inspiring to see how that, um, how that our work has impacted um, and hopefully made their job, their lives and their jobs easier in, in some way. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Um, next, could you talk about, you know, sort of what you see as the future of both your own role and as RMI in general, like in, you know, 10 years, what do you see yourself doing and what do you see your RMI doing? Yeah, another good question. Um, so RMI's goal for the next 10 years is to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 50% um, and are, will be able to be focusing on kind of the last uh, frontier of getting to um, the 2050 goal and keeping um, the temperature increase by only 1.5 degrees Celsius. And so um, I think at that point, you know, we won't be working with cities on creating um, pathways to decarbonize their electricity or their mobility systems, but we'll be working with them on like refining the programs that they have in place. Um, and as cities are changing and populations are increasing or decreasing, um, as you know, new mobility systems uh, come into place, you know, working to kind of make them make all of the systems and the programs that have gotten us to, you know, that outcome in 2030 uh, resilient over time, as we see what kind of happens after that. So that's kind of uh, at a high level what I what I envision the work at RMI changing to. Um, what what I am going to be doing in ten years a little bit more complicated of a question I think. Um, I I love working at RMI. It's uh, super fulfilling, and I um, love being surrounded by a bunch of energy nerds who you can just kind of talk about things with all day. So it's a, it's a great organization. So I could definitely see myself um, here you know, focusing on either the evolution of our, our city's focused work. Um, I could also see myself going back into the private sector and being on the other side of the table. So some of the corporations and uh, cities that we've helped um, thus far and then working on that side. So actually being within a corporate or corporation or within a city, um, working on the inside instead of kind of on the outside. Awesome. All right, well, so our next segment here uh, is talking about your path from from you know, the beginnings of your time at Middlebury into your current role. So you majored in environmental studies and economics at Middlebury, is that right? Yes. Okay, and so how did you decide on those two majors? Yeah, so I, I knew that I wanted to uh, eventually work in a field that I cared about. And so that was kind of how I had thought about what I needed to study in college. Um, I hadn't done anything in environment um, before getting to Middlebury, but knew that they had an incredible environmental program. Um, and uh, I had also liked math and econ in, in high school. So knew that was something that I'd wanted to kind of keep up. Um, and I had kind of some interest in like the finance side um, of the environmental space. Um, and so that's kind of how I, I decided to, um, to do that. I think, I don't think I chose to be an econ and uh, focus for the environmental major until end of sophomore year, um, but kind of went in, took a bunch of introductory classes, knew that the environment, you know, in some realm was something I wanted to focus on um, and went from there. Awesome. Uh, and so then could you talk about, you know, sort of your path into your current position about, you know, sort of your, your first jobs out of Middlebury or, you know, anything you yeah. did with your summers while you were in school? Yeah, um, I, I did, my, all of my internships while I was at mid were fairly related. Um, the first job that I got, um, I was through a like a family friend who worked for an environmental consulting firm whose friend needed an intern. And it was not what I had thought it was originally, but it was a job and I knew, you know, your first internship is the hardest one to get because you have nothing on your resume. Um, and so I helped um, with a lot of Freedom of Information Act or FOIA requests. Um, I helped go to, to like paint factories and would look to make sure that they weren't, um, you know, 
missing any EPA guidelines or not up to par on different um, requirements before these factories were sold. Um, and so it was, it was people who are kind of just trying to make the mark, not people who are trying to improve uh, the environment. So it was a really interesting experience. It was uh, cool working for a consulting firm, um, but it was, I knew, kind of knew that I wanted to be working on a little bit more forward thinking issues. Um, and so after that, I, uh, I worked for a um, hotel group called the Saunders Hotel Group that had an environmental consulting arm, um, but it was really, Hands on. We were. I was staffed in a hotel in Boston. That's where their offices were, um, and we were focused on, you know, switching out LED light bulbs and understanding what the economic implication of that would be. Um, you know, thinking about how we uh, use carbon offsets for um, our our hotel use, but also kind of offering them to our guests. Um, who and they we had a program where they could offset their you know flight to get there and their room electricity and things like that. Um, and so that was a, a more uh, social side um, of carbon, more like individual focus versus industry focus. So that was an interesting, interesting perspective as well. Um, and then my ultimate first job after graduating mid, um, I worked in project finance for a solar developer. Um, and I got that job through a connection with the Middlebury alum who I uh, met through Midnet, which I, I don't know if actually Midnet exists anymore, but the Middlebury Alumni Connection mm -hmm. Network uh, was kind of randomly reached out to him um, and ended up interviewing um, Forrest Bond and his team. Um, and I I think why I decided to go into solar financing was because of a um, senior class I took with Professor Aisham, who was also my advisor, um, where we had to do a environmental economics project. And so I worked on a team um, with three other women who, um, and we all did the financial analysis and completed a report um, that was printed to the board to um, explain why that the school should um, invest in the solar farm that is currently behind by Hall. Um, yep. And so the solar developer had come with a proposal of like what the contract would look like and a few different options. And so we built a financial model um, that would kind of talk about the different options that the um, college had in buying out the uh, project after, you know, five, 10, 15 years and what the implications would be and what it would compare if they just bought their own panels outright um, and then explained kind of what the panels were doing and, uh, you know, from a, from a tech side and how it would impact our carbon footprint and things like that. So it was a, uh, it was my first kind of like real world project. Um, mm -hmm. And it gave me um, a lot of skills and ability to just talk uh, the language that needed to be spoken on the interviews that I did with um, a few solar developers, which I think really helped me um, kind of identify myself as a good candidate, even though I was still in college, because um, a lot of people were interviewing with a few years of experience. So just being able to like say I knew what a power purchase agreement was, or I could talk about, you know, kilowatts and kilowatt hours was, mm -hmm. um, was something that was, was really helpful. So I, yeah, I worked for a solar developer in project finance and project development for uh, about two, yeah, two and a half years, um, and then moved on to RMI. Awesome. So that you sort of just answered one of my next questions about, um, you know, a skill or asset you gained at Middlebury that helped you get your first job. Do you think that there is another, you know, defining skill or asset that you got uh, specifically from Middlebury? And if you talk about how that helped you get either your first job or your current position at RMI? Yeah. So yes, I think working on that solar project was, was probably the reason I got my first job. Um, but kind of more broadly speaking, how what I learned from Middlebury that helped me maybe excel in in my first position and at RMI, um, I would say uh, writing Mill Mill Middlebury's kind of ability to make you write a lot. Uh, at the time, I didn't necessarily love it all the time, but um, I think the the realization, like I was speaking to earlier, that you know climate change is such a complex problem, and you need to be able to uh, distill what you're talking about down and um, explain it in a very easy to understand and concise way for a variety of audiences um, has really helped me throughout my career. Um, so I would say, you know, value those writing courses, whether it's an actual English or writing course or just the writing you're doing in other 
other environmental or other courses, um, it definitely came uh, to help. And I looked back at some of my um, like shorter opinion papers and things like that, definitely when I was starting at RMI and to understand kind of how to argue things. Um, so I, I would say definitely that. Um, let's see, what else? Um, Excel, I think uh, most jobs, if you're gonna wanna work in this like think tank um, or analytical space are using some form of Excel. I think the next five or 10 years, we may see the emergence of some, you know, higher level statistical analysis software uh, become, make Excel more obsolete. But I think uh, we're still kind of rooted in that, that data and analysis world now. And so um, I had taken a few classes where I was fairly savvy with like Excel and Excel formulas and shortcuts and things like that. So that definitely helped me, um, definitely helped me, definitely helped me as well. Um, and I think this is, this is like a, ch a cheap one almost, but I think teamwork, like Middlebury emphasizes a lot in working in groups. I played a, a two JV sports at Middlebury. So, you know, the ability to kind of work with people and, and understand um, where people are coming from um, and being able to kind of manage intergroup conflict and create productive relationships is, has been, has been really integral in my career as well. Awesome. Um, so could you, what, to talk about what sort of academic background you think might be, you know, most compatible with a role like yours? Yeah, so what I would say um, to that is, I think RMI looks for people who are really passionate about what they're working on. Um, and that is like first and foremost, um, I think the most important thing. And so if there, if there is a, an area at mid, whether it is, you know, environmental economics or a like, certain uh, angle or implementation of environmental chemistry or how chemistry plays into climate change that like you are really passionate about. Um, that is that being able to kind of describe that and explain why you care about it is is really important. So I would say that's not really an academic background, but just understanding that your academic background does matter. And, you know, if you're passionate about it, you could definitely see. Um, and then the second would be, I would say, um, any sort of kind of economic analysis, um, data analysis background um, is generally helpful because a lot of the positions in these like think tank like organizations um, or institutions are uh, a lot of data analysis and research in the beginning. And so the ability to um, to have experience in that or explain that you know how to use those programs is is super helpful. I, I think the most important thing and the thing that I tell people when I talk to them who are applying to RMI is that you know, every every little piece of your academic background matters. So if, you know, it, it, it just because you don't have an internship on something or you don't have job experience on a particular topic, you know, if, if I'm reading a resume or a cover letter and I see that a person wrote their thesis or they wrote a report or they took a class on, you know, X, Y, and Z, and they're, they are obviously passionate about it or, or have, you know, volunteered and worked for a group on campus, um, that matters, you know, just as much um, as, as working in, in the real world as well. So the ability to kind of pick out those um, nuggets from your academic background that end up kind of directly applying to whatever job, uh, job you are looking for um, is, is really, I think, a beneficial uh, way to go about the application process. Awesome. Thank you. Well, this has all been great advice, um, which, you know, sort of is our last segment here is to sort of ask for, you know, what general advice you might have to students who are thinking about their space in the in the green economy and, you know, a career advice um, and sort of just any last tips you have to share would be great. Yeah, so I would say, I mean, this platform, like I said earlier, is so incredible and I would um, I'm jealous it was not there when I was at mid. But I would really definitely emphasize using the Middlebury connections um, in whatever form they may be, whether it's through a career office, whether it's through like, um, you know, some version of um, Middlebury's coaching um, and just, you know, or blind reaching out to people on LinkedIn. I get that all the time. And I, I love it. Um, and to not be bashful or feel bad about bugging someone if they don't respond to you. Um, there are definitely times where I like see a LinkedIn message and then something I get distracted and they respond two weeks later and I feel terrible. And I remember being in that seat being like, oh my goodness, like, should I email this person again? Is that rude? Like, you know, they're older than me and I 
uh, now being in that position, like, please email me 50 times. I mm -hmm. will respond, you know, and if you are the most annoying one, you probably will get a response first. <laughs> so um, I would say that would be like my number one thing. I think I've always found it really helpful to hear from people in the space um, and just hear, like you said, what their jobs are like, exactly what this, what this, um, you know, video podcast is doing. Um, and um, we love hiring Middlebury grads into our companies. So um, it would be, it would be great. Um, and then, like I said earlier, I think, you know, if you are passionate about something and, um, you know, feel free to like, let that shine. I think that is super important, um, especially in this broad field of fighting climate change, where we're going to need, you know, a whole host of solutions from every different angle to uh, solve this problem. And so, you know, passion on, on a variety of different things, no matter how big or how niche or small they may be, um, will be really important going forward. And I think um, people really value uh, hearing that kind of honesty about what people care about. Awesome. Well, Ali, thank you so much for your engagement today and helping students prepare for their first career destinations. Uh, that concludes this episode within the series, Exploring Careers in the Green Economy. In closing, I would encourage viewers to tune in to get career perspectives and advice from a number of professionals in a broad variety of organizations in our other episodes. I would also encourage you to tune into the other MidVantage series, which can be accessed through the events and programs tabs on the CCI website. Thank you so much, Ali, and thank you everybody for watching. Thanks, Andrew.